Andy uh, gave you a, a sort of brief overview about what today is about. Um, gave me some some suggestions as to what I could talk about. Um, so as he mentioned, uh, you know, there were three big themes, and he asked me to focus on things like capability and skill sets. You know, mobility. Um, you know, engagement. Um, possibly touching on things like bring your own device. Um, he also mentioned that you know he didn't expect you to leave um, this room as experts on any of these topics. Um, I guess the challenge is I suspect many of you already arrive as experts in a lot of these topics, so um, not to derail the day from the start, I'm not going to talk about much of that at all. I'm going to talk about this instead. Um, my exciting life as a civil servant. And uh, to continue the show of hands approach, how many of you believe that working in the civil service is exciting? Please raise your hand. Ooh, that's the lowest, lowest show of hands we've had so far, so probably about 10%. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry to inform you, but you are wrong. Um, and I know you're wrong, and I know it for a fact, because we are very fortunate we now have a canonical source of truth, and that source of truth is Twitter, and Twitter says it's exciting. Um, so it is. So I work in the government digital service. It is very exciting. Um, I guess the, the other theme for the day was uh, in with the new. Um, so to start off, I'm going to talk about the old. Um, because the old is actually quite important. Um, and if you're actually looking at you know, the big transformations that we're trying to make and in introducing the new, um, you have to start unpicking what the old was about. And in particular, you have to start unpicking some of the consensus that drove what the old was. And so um, what do I think the old was? This was the old model for technology in government, which was multi-year sourcing contracts uh, multi-year role in consultancy engagements with a small number of very large suppliers. Uh, things which we refer to, or have been referred to as the oligopoly, which is a very big word. It's not my word, it's his word. Um, if you don't know who this is, this is Francis Maud. He's a minister for the cabinet office, um, and he's the one who encouraged the, the creation of the um, Efficiency and Reform Group, which Government Digital Services is part of. And he had some quite strong words to say about the way that IT was done um, in government. And these are his words as well, so I'll let you read those. So some quite powerful words there about the situation um, that was kind of currently in place with, you know, with um, uh, you know, these large SIs. You know, bad for users, bad for the taxpayer, and bad for growth. And if you think about it, what, what government departments typically had done was to outsource most of their IT um, to you know, one or more large suppliers who effectively would do the IT, because IT historically was, or was treated as being not particularly important. I think one of the reasons for this, I'm trying to figure out you know, why this, this happened, uh, and you know, I have to own up, I used to work for a large systems integrator. Um, and I did quite a lot of work with them on their outsourcing cost models. So I kind of understand, you know, some of the, some of the thinking that was on the supply side around this. Um, and I think, you know, part of it was probably driven sort of towards the late 90s, early 2000s um, by this concept of what's core and what's non-core. Um, and this kind of strategic view that said, actually, you know, if you focus on what's core in your organization, you should then just outsource everything that's non-core. And IT was viewed as non-core. Now, this, you know, it's great, I used these, um, you know, I used to do component business modeling, going to a client, kind of show them what was core and what was non-core. IT, interestingly, was always non-core and something they should outsource to um, the company that I work for. Um, and it's kind of interesting, if you think about it, if you think about, you know, the decisions that organizations make, um, you know, what happens if, if, you, if you get this wrong? So I kind of like to, you know, think back to a time when, you know, if Nokia as a company, you know, they had a small division that was saying, actually, we think we should do, uh, you know, mobile phones. And just think what would have happened if the organization said, well, that's not core to our business, is it really? You know, we'll just concentrate on what we do. You know, what would have happened to Nokia then? So this kind of, you know, very simplistic view that actually, you know, IT is not core to an organization, I don't think really holds, you know, much water in, in the 21st century. Um, and actually, if you start to break down what is IT, what is technology, um, you know, we're starting to look at it in terms of this, this quadrant here. Because you can't just bundle everything up and give it to somebody else to manage as their problem. Um, there are different tensions driving the different elements of, of what we do in technology. So effectively, we've kind of got things like digital public services 
a mission IT system, so digital public services would be the kinds of things that we see online, you know, renewing your tax disk is, you know, one of them, you know, the, the services with the most take up. Mission IT system, so if you're a you know, Department for Work and Pensions, that's a benefit system. If you're HMRC, that's a revenue collection system, a tax collection system. You know, these are the things which are really important. They're quite unique to your industry. So, you know, you can't just go out and say, well, I'll have a tax collection system. There's, you know, 100 different versions of them out there. I'll just choose one that works best for me. They really are quite unique. And what you need to do in these areas is actually really focus on developing and building things which meet your customer needs, meet the needs of the people who are actually using these services. In contrast, the things below the line are actually tending much more towards commodity. So, um, you know, it's fairly straightforward when you think about desktops or hosting or networks. These are not things which you need to build a special for government. Um, you know, the, the, we don't have special government electricity or special government water, so the concept that we would have special government networks or special government desktops um, doesn't seem to make much sense. Um, and then this term, which is a kind of reserved term in government of shared services, which what we mean is things like finance, human resources, procurement. Again, these are tending towards commodity things, as what we care about is the cost per user. And the key for these things here is that you should be able to swap them in and out regularly. And they're based on the price. You know, the price is what's really important. So you have to structure these things so when they run on this infrastructure that they can actually swap out the infrastructure when you see a better offer and a better deal, which doesn't necessarily mean a long five-year contract for your hosting or a five-year contract for your desktops. It means using open standards so that when you need to swap to a different desktop provider or a different infrastructure provider, you can do quickly and easily, and you can ensure that there is decent market competition in these spaces. So this is some of the ways that we're now starting to think about this and starting to break up those big contracts into um, uh, different uh, smaller um, uh, approaches. Um, we're trying to disaggregate the big bundles of contracts into, into things which actually you know, are very specific. So instead of saying, you know, just provide all services, you know, we're breaking out hosting, desktops, networks, and then the mission IT systems. And what we're finding is that you know, approximately 30% of 30 savings occur, can occur just by unbundling um, those big contracts. But to tie it all together, you really need open standards. There's no, you know, it doesn't work if you are delivering things which are very tightly controlled, very tightly locked down, if, as the case in many government organizations, um, you know, the applications that you use are based on specific versions of operating systems, specific versions of Java, you know, which only work in a special government desktop, which has lots and lots of security layers built on top of it to make sure that only that supplier understands how that works. If you're in that, case, you know, that situation, it's very hard for you to switch into a different supplier. So, um, Andy very um, kindly talked about some of Tim O'Reilly's comments. Um, last year we published our open standards approach and we got some very nice comments as well from uh, some, some very neat uh, uh, publications. And the effects of this, the sort of unbundling, starting to look at you know, what the specific needs are for the specific areas IT is starting to be felt. So we just recently had a report from the National Audit Office um, looking at the savings that we're making through our IT initiatives. Um, and, you know, unusually for government, it actually said that we were me making the savings that we promised. Um, and this year, you know, we, we think that we're soon to be published, but we think we're kind of heading sort of north of 400 million in terms of savings over the year. So, and these are in-year savings. These are not, you know, uh, spread out over a number of years. And, you know, this is a great time to be a supplier, I think, because when I look at those multi-year enterprise deals, you know, I just try to pull together, you know, from, from, from what we've got, can publicly got out there, what the timeline is and what the timescales are for when these deals come to an end. And you can kind of see in 2014, 2015, a lot of these big deals come to an end. Um, and, you know, and that, that kind of, you know, graph, that, you know, that, that line of, of how things are happening really says to me there's an awful lot of opportunity there. So when we talk about things like G Cloud and, you know, we've had a reasonable amount of uptake, but it's very, very early days, you start to see that as these big deals come to an end and as departments and organizations are looking to have a much more diverse supply base, um, that there is an awful lot of opportunity there for, for, for spend to be channeled in different ways to a much more diverse set of suppliers. So this is the kind of stuff that we're doing to, to unpick the old. Um, to make way for the new. And, you know, you start to, to do this, you, you change the consensus, but nobody really believes it unless you're actually building new things as well. 
So this is where you know, we start to look at, so what is 21st century government about anyway? Um, and I'm not sure I really have all the answers, um, but I think it probably involves some things like these. So I think it involves things like gov.uk. Um, and the interesting thing for me, you know, I mean, apart from the fact that it's, um, you know, the, the tagline here of simpler, clearer, and faster, um, is that it's built using a platform approach. So what we decided to do with gov.uk was not to just go out and choose a content management system, which we will um, implement and then, uh, you know, just push all content onto it. We built a platform approach, which then allows um, government digital services and departments to build products on it which meet user needs. So there might be products which, you know, enable us to engage better with citizens. Might be products which enable us to um, ensure that democracy works. Might be products that allow us, you know, allow people to engage with, um, you know, the, the rights to do things. And I think, you know, one of the key things when you look at 21st century government, and without trying to get, uh, you know, very philosophical about this, but, you know, look at where power is held and access to the ability to do stuff. If you make it hard for people to do stuff, then you're centralizing power. Um, you, you know, actually, you, what you would want to be doing is making it easier for people to do the things that they need to do. And this is, um, uh, you know, I guess I had to touch on analytics at some point. So this is the, um, the, the uh, sneak view, I think, of the iPad app, which was built for the prime minister. So this is the kind of thing you need to use when you're running a country. Um, but it's not just, you know, certainly not just about, you know, GDS being a cool place to work and doing lots of wonderful things. Um, you know, it is, uh, it does, um, but most of those things are actually done together with people in departments uh, and agencies. People are actually trying to do, you know, a lot of the hard yards, changing, um, you know, delivery approaches, changing the organizations, changing the services that they provide to users. So a key part of our digital strategy was not just to provide gov.uk, that's done. The next step is around you know, looking at the big services, the services that citizens most and businesses most often require from government and transforming them so that they are digital by default. And as you can see, you know, this is not a uh, you know, kind of hipster London-centric thing. We're doing this, um, as he points the wrong way, all over the country. So up in, we just had a presentation yesterday from the guys in student loans company about a lot of the changes they're making to the way that people apply for um, student funding. And they're getting, you know, seeing some really great um, uh, differences in terms of customer satisfaction by fixing some of their broken transactions. But this is happening all over the country, in government departments all over the place. There are digital teams being created to try and you know, uh, change the way that these services are delivered. There are people called digital leaders being put in place who work at board level, who give those organizations the, you know, the accountability and the, the ability to go away and deliver great things. And how do you do it? You do it with multidisciplinary teams, um, maybe people who don't look like uh, traditional civil servants. Uh, I'm not sure what a traditional civil servant is anymore. I think you know, when you look around the place, um, people do look very different. And the job roles that they have, they're, they're kind of different things. That, you know, um, you know, they might be called developers, they might be called designers. You know, design is a really important part about making it a digital service that really works. We have this concept of a service manager, somebody who is accountable for that service. You know, this is a really hard change for some departments to, to get their heads around. You know, actually, it's not just about building a product and putting it live. You have to have somebody who is fundamentally accountable for the, uh, the maintenance, the improvement, the management of that service moving forward. And of course, we do have you know, the normal kind of civil service type roles around policy and communications, whose role quite often actually is to protect the people who are building things from some of the governance and some of the, me the, the mechanics that the civil service, you know, can impose. And how do we do this? This is something which is really, really simple to say. It's deceptively simple. Start with the user need. And by user need, we mean those people out there, um, you know, the real people who actually use the services. We don't mean um, you know, the management teams within departments. Um, and the reason why this is deceptively simple is because this actually starts to, you know, user needs trump all the other needs that the organization might come up with. So this actually gets you into some really deep and difficult discussions with how you organize the services that you deliver. And, you know, we do face some challenges because we can't build websites with tools designed for building bridges. Uh, and if you look in most organizations, the, you know, the governance approaches that people have to um, uh, put up with um, don't lend themselves naturally to, to the kinds of digital services that we're looking to create. 
Because the traditional way, and you know, I spent quite a lot of my time in, in Department for Work and Pensions, um, and the traditional way that we would do things, would, we would figure out that there was you know, a need for something. Um, we'd have some very, very bright people focusing on um, making the policy around what we need to do. Um, and then it would come to uh, people in the IT organization. And we'd say, well, we, can't, we don't know what to build because we don't have your requirements. So please, can you go away and write down your requirements in lots of detail so that we don't get it wrong? Because we know that sometimes government has got it wrong in the past. And one way to protect ourselves against this is if we make you write it down in big documents. And when you've spent six months documenting your requirements to the nth degree, um, because you don't want to miss anything, because you know what IT is like, they'll never deliver it if you don't get it in the first instance, um, then we'll go out and procure. Um, and again, that will be an, uh, a very elongated process, which may take you know, somewhere between one and two years. Um, and once we've done all that, you know, we finally get uh, you know, a supplier in, they'll start developing. Um, and then, you know, maybe two and a half years down the track, we'll deliver something, push it out there, and see what the users think of it. And interestingly, you know, quite a lot of the time, what did the users think of it? Well, the answer was not much. Um, you know, we haven't got a great track record in delivering great services. So the way we're trying to do things is actually um, through spending a bit more time up front doing discovery work, actually figuring out what is it that we're trying to do, what are the needs that we're trying to meet, and then we'll very quickly you know, produce an alpha, something that everybody can see and touch and say, is this meeting the user need? And we will test it with real users to find out what they think of it. Um, and if we're successful, then we'll move on to a beta. At the end of the alpha stage, we may just throw it away, start again with something else, because we found through testing that it doesn't work. And we'll continue this iterative approach until we finally um, decide that a service is live. And the difference can be quite you know, stark. I mean, it's not just about you know, the speed to development but it's also about you know, the, the cost and effort for all parties, not just you know, for government, but also for suppliers involved in, in making these new services. So for example, you know, we would quite easily spend six million pounds creating these wonderful documents that which you can then hand over to somebody and say, go build that, please. You know, or we could actually work with users, work with development teams and produce something which we think is along the lines of what we might want to produce. Um, I guess the other key point about um, government in the 21st century um, is just being open about what we're doing uh, and open about the way that we approach things. Um, this, I think, is, is, is a really interesting um, uh, approach, our performance platform. Um, I'm kind of smiling because I kind of know of some sneak things which are coming in, in the future, which I think are really exciting, but I can't talk about. Um, but what this is about is we def define that for digital services, you know, there are four key indicators. Um, and then we measured them for all the digital services that are out there, and then we published that data. And what that means is not only is it useful for us and for service managers within government to understand how does their service perform, but also means that the public can hold this to account. Um, so you can see, for example, you know, the cost per transaction of the services that we offer, and you see massive, massive differences um, for things which may be similar, you know, which you might expect to be fairly similar services. We're also publishing things like you know, the digital take-up of those services. So, you know, if, you know, approximately 80% of the people are online and happy to conduct commercial transactions online, why is the take-up of uh, government digital services, why does it vary between, you know, something like, you know, 20% and 50 to 60% in the good cases? You know, understanding what that take-up is, measuring it, understanding what we need to change to make our services so good that people want to use them. The other thing, um, I don't know if people have seen this, but uh, it was published in um, April, the 16th, I think, is um, our approach to how we actually go about building services. This is the service design manual. All uh, digital services from 2014 will have to meet a thing called the service standard. Um, it's a set of rules. Um, includes things like, you know, before you go live, your minister must have been able to complete a transaction on your service. You know, neat things like that. Um, but it also contains a lot of, you know, guidance about not just this is the rule, but here's how we go about building things that allow you to meet that rule. Um, it's a really good um, resource. There's more coming very shortly. Um, a lot of stuff which also kind of looks at, you know, from, from an IT perspective, how do you, uh, you know, change things so that you can actually enable these digital services to be, to be made. Um, figuring out what we do. Um, my team uh, lead the open standards um, approach for government, um, and we one of the things that we're very clear about with open standards that would be a really stupid thing to do would be if we just sat in a smoky, dark-filled, you know, smoke-filled, a darkened room, sorry, whatever that 
phrases, um, and decided what standards we should implement and then just issued some decrees and forced everybody to use them. That's probably a recipe for disaster. So what we're doing is being very open about the, the business problems that we're trying to solve um, and encouraging people to come and actually tell us what they think the, the standards should be. So, I mean, it's got some... This is open. Please, if you've got some views and standards, do contribute. We're, we're, we're really looking for people to contribute. And it's got some really important things in there. So, you know, I think one of the first things that we will um, cover is the, uh, this thing, which is um, a really boring name, multi-agency incident transfer for something very, very important, which is when emergencies happen, how do the emergency services communicate to each other by means other than phones and phone and fax, which unfortunately does happen sometimes today. So, um, you know, that's uh, really important for us. And it's not just about standard, it's also about, you know, when government builds things, let's, let's, um, you know, let's publish what we build and you know, let's make it open source, let other people use it. You know, so this is, you know, gov.uk, uh, a lot of the, the workings of that are published on GitHub. We do know that other governments are taking um, uh, the code that we produced. Um, I think Honolulu uh, was one of them, uh, which is uh, reusing UK government code, which is fantastic. I don't think anybody so far blagged a trip to go and help them to do it, which I'm sure everybody's desperate to do. Um, but, you know, this is the, I guess the thing is when you are doing things which are um, specific for your industry, then, you know, actually being able to share that across organizations is really, really important. Um, we're looking at some of the things that, uh, for example, Estonia have done in terms of data integration across places. You know, that might be something that we want to, to borrow within the UK. So, so actually doing things in an open source way does allow us to get things done um, a lot quicker. So we can get better for less. We can bring in the new. Um, as long as we build it on open standards and open source and not closed systems, as long as we're religious about building services based on user needs, you know, that's what we're up to. I told you it was quite exciting. Okay. And that's it. Questions? said we were tight on time, we, need, we now do have time for questions. So any questions for David? Okay, got one down here. Just wait for the mic because we're live streaming so we need the audience to hear it. Hello. You're building a system which almost every government in the world should be uh, copying. How much, inter how much value in what you're doing is, well, how much, in fact, how much compatibility is there between a UK system and other countries' systems? Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, and we pretty much, I would say, every week um, do have visitors from other countries who are looking to, to understand, um, you know, what we've done. Um, I think, you know, it's, as with anything, it, it's, it's not the case that you can, you know, that you should, I would say, just take what we've done and, uh, you know, stick it on some server and run it. Um, but I think if you look at the needs of governments across, um, across countries, then... Actually, a lot of them are very, very, sim are very similar. So, um, you know, if you look within, um, certainly within Europe, you know, because a lot of the things that we do are, are tied to, to European rules, then there is a lot of similarity between, um, you know, the, the, the requirements that you might have. So um, if you look at sort of export handling, things like that, then, you know, it's driven by European Union rules. Um, so, so, so there is, you know, a lot, an awful lot of uh, commonality there. Um, I think... You know what we are trying to do is, is is forge partnerships with those countries who are doing things which are you know which we find interesting. So it's not just you know countries coming here, but also uh, us learning from other countries. Um, you know I, I mentioned Estonia; they have this thing called X Road, which is how they share information between um, uh, government organisations and for, for the citizen and government organisations. And they have some laws which basically mean that you can't duplicate information that another government organization already holds. And this is incredibly powerful when you think about it. If you were doing, when you think about when you look at your online transactions with government, how many times are you asked for the information which you know you've already told another part of government somewhere? Now, they've passed laws that make that effectively illegal to ask for that information. They've also passed laws that, make, that ensure that any government organization that holds information makes it available for other organizations to use. Um, and they built an infrastructure which allows that to happen really quite simply and cheaply. So, so you know, there are an awful lot of commonalities across, you know, within, it's, it's an industry thing, so there are lots of commonalities within the, the government industry across countries. So it's a bit, bit of a vague answer, but I'd say lots, but a lot of untapped potential, I think. 
Me? Okay. Um, sorry, this is... Uh, I mean, you've outlined a, a vision of a world where uh, I, everything comes online. Tim, sorry. sorry. Could I just ask questions to introduce them? Sorry, Tim sorry. Simpson. I'm a trustee of EDU, sir. Um, uh, how do you see the challenge of getting everybody online? I mean, there's, it's well known. There's 20, 30% of people who are resolutely resisting. How, how, how do we handle that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, and, you know, we have um, published, you know, papers around, di you know, our view on digital inclusion. I think you kind of have to uh, differentiate between um, those who don't want to go online and those who can't go online. Um, I think you have to understand, um, uh, you know, what's the, uh, you know, you drive it by the user need. What's the best way to help um, people who can't get online access the services that they need and the, the, you know there will be a variety of ways of doing that I think you know one of the the, 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 the sort of the, the obvious answer is that it probably feels like the, it's quite a local solution to local problems depending on the you know the, the situation that somebody is in um, you know if it's that you know the connectivity is so appalling because you're living in a rural area and so it practically you know you would like to be online but you can't be um, you know, then there are, uh, you know, approaches that you might want to take around, you know, centralizing some services or delivering services, um, you know, a, a number of services from a certain place. Um, if you can't get online, then I think you have the question of agency to look at. So do you, is it because um, uh, you actually would like to empower somebody else to operate online on your behalf? So you might have a carer who can do that on your behalf and you're happy to do that. Or it might be that actually, you know, online is just not an option you still want to be able to do things but you need to speak to somebody face to face because your needs are so specific so the question there is how do you you know construct um, a, a, a service delivery mode which allows you to give those people who need face-to-face -face interaction the face-to-face -face interaction they need without duplicating that across multiple organizations in government so um, I don't think there's any um, you know silver bullet to this I think it really is just driving it through um, uh, user needs understanding the different categories of user need and developing approaches which which will match those hi um, Sam Coxage Department for Work and Pensions um, and I'm uh, accessibility assurance variety um, just a question, yes, it is digital by default, but I've been to quite a few conferences now of people that don't work in government departments that are saying it's only digital, um, and that is a serious concern. But is that the message that we want to put out to try and you know, reinforce that we, we want everybody to go down that line? But really, you know, my concern is that we're saying that that's all it will be, and that, that's not the right message, I would have thought, to put out for our disabled citizens. Okay, so I mean, I think the, the clear answer is, um, hopefully it's clear, um, no, that's not the message. You know, it's not only digital, um, it's digital by default. We do know that there are, you know, the majority of people are online and able to transact online. So we should be building services which meet their needs, but where you either won't or can't, um, then we need to be providing the appropriate services for, for, for those individuals. So it, it's definitely not only digital. Hi, David. Fraser Miles, uh, MOD. Hopefully you'll recall my, my program that, uh, that, that I'm currently involved with. Um, I, I certainly can, with respect to my own program, I identify a number of products out there which I'd love to be able to just, you know, go and do the alpha and beta models and then, uh, and then implement as, as your diagram suggested. But I still uh, feel heavily constrained by the current um, routes to procurement that I feel are imposed uh, on me. Uh, through the MOD and, and also then through, uh, through the Cabinet Office. And what are you doing then in order to try and uh, facilitate the, uh, the, the, the preferred model um, that you've demonstrated uh, rather than the more traditional and elongated routes to procurement? Okay. So um, th there's a, this wonderful resource which is not, not, not a lot of people seem to know about it, which is um, a whole set of guidance around lean procurement. Um, and in working with government departments, if you Google lean procurement cabinet office, I think it, it takes you straight to the site. But, um, you know, there's a whole set of things there around how you run lean procurements, how you engage, you know, do informal meetings with the market prior to launching a PIN or an OJU. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually kind of seems to me to be the, you know, the de facto answer to a lot of, a lot of the issues that we face. 
Um, but it's, you know, I think not very many people seem to know about it. So, so I think that's one thing to, to, to check. I think the other thing is making sure that, um, uh, you know, so, so we've obviously we've got the um, public service network frameworks. We've got things like G Cloud. Um, at the moment, we're looking at, you know, what, what's the next stage of development for G Cloud? Uh, I mean, it, it, it operates and, uh, you know, reasonably well, but it's very early days so far. Uh, and I think the question is, how do you, um, you know, create that um, vibrant marketplace, um, which is, you know, doesn't involve lots of hurdles for suppliers um, uh, in order to enter that marketplace, but at the same time actually meets the needs of what departments are buying. So I think, you know, one of the things that we haven't done very well so far is be really clear about what it is that departments are looking to buy. And I think the more clear we can be about, you know, these are the kind of standard items that departments want to buy, I think that will help the, you know, the, the supply side actually understand what they need to offer in order to meet those needs. And at the moment, we've kind of just, uh, you know, more or less allowed, you know, suppliers to offer their wares and government departments having to kind of say, well, actually, what I want is not quite that. It's something like this. So it's, it's a bit of, you know, it's, a, it, it's, and I still think, remember, you know, G Cloud is, is only a year old. It's still very early days. Um, and I think as we um, uh, kind of take the approach of, you know, uh, sorry to be boring about it, but look at the user needs. Now we've actually got some users using it and we can figure out both from the supply side and from the buy side where it doesn't meet those user needs. Uh, Philip French, also an EduServe trustee. Uh, David, you spoke very compellingly about the work that Government Digital has done, and it shows in the quality of some of those digital public services already delivered. I wondered how you, you felt the same principles and approach could apply into the top left segment of your diagram, the line of business major transactional heavy lifting systems. Yeah. No, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's been occupying, occupying my mind quite a lot recently. So, so I showed you the, 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 uh, the service design manual, which has you know, all the, a lot of the principles that you need to have um, to, in order to create um, you know, a, a really compelling digital service. Um, and we actually started to look at that, um, uh, producing a similar set of guidance for you know, how you do the, the mission IT systems. Um, and you know, some of my team kind of went away and wrote lots of stuff. And then when we actually looked at what was in the service design manual, we realized we're just replicating an awful lot of that stuff. It's actually, you know, a lot of the approaches are very, very similar. Um, and I think the, you know, the challenge in that mission IT world is really to, uh, you know, to some extent, I think we've been in a product mindset. Um, I think it's been very common for organizations to, you know, kind of do that logical view of, what does the organization do? Well, we deal with customers, therefore we must have a customer relationship management system. You know, we deal with, uh, you know, cases of things, therefore we must have a, at least one or more case management systems. Um, and kind of looking at that, you know, jumping straight to, so what's the product that we should buy that meets those needs? And I think kind of, you know, by taking that sort of, you know, discovery alpha beta role, you may end up still buying some products but I think you'll buy a lot, lot fewer products than we would otherwise do because I think we'll understand that actually we don't necessarily need you know, an expensive business rule system or an expensive case management system. We only need a little bit of functionality from one and actually we can find that another way. So I think you know, there are some of those, some of the principles in terms of how we do it will drive um, you know, a change there. But I think it also takes a change in the way that architects view you know, how you break down the needs that the businesses come to you, come to you with. Okay, we've got a question down the front from Twitter. Sorry, Tim, making you run. Matt. Hi, two, question, two questions from Matthew Squires on Twitter. The first one is, David, would you give your views on static education, i.e. online text versus interactive, so e-learning and webinars? Oh, um, I think I um, have so little expertise in that area, um, it would be kind of pointless. Um, I, I, I did very early in my career work uh, in the learning side of IBM where we were pushing people towards uh, e-learning and doing online tests, but you know, honestly, that was 15 years ago, so I'm so out of touch. I, I, okay, and the second one also from Matthew Squires, what are the four measures for each IT service that you mentioned earlier? So, so the KPIs. Yes. Oh, this is the test, isn't it? Because I bet I can remember three and then struggle for the fourth. So the KPIs were a digital take-up, so how, you know, what percentage of people are taking up your uh, transaction, 
um, cost per transaction, um, completion rate, so how many people who start your service actually complete it, and the fourth one is uh, what's the user satisfaction, so how satisfied are people with your users, so those are the four. If you Google um, performance framework, performance platform um, for uh, GDS, then you'll find uh, those things, and also you'll start to see some of the reporting from departments against those measures. And David, do you have examples where though making those metrics public has resulted in changes to the way services are delivered, or is it too early days for that to be happening? I think it's um, I think they they are currently helping, um, and what they're helping at the moment I mean I'm not sure that making them public is necessarily the driver because I think you know there is a recognition for organizations who are producing those services, that these are helpful metrics to drive the changes that, that you need. So, um, you know, I wouldn't want to, to kind of, you, know, you don't put all the credit on the fact that you publish it. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, one of the examples I referred to earlier, the student loans company, they were well aware of some of the metrics that they had around, um, you know, completion of, uh, of, of um, uh, applications online. And so, you know, for example, they, they told us that, you know, for every application that somebody completes online, they usually have four and a half, you know, on average, four and a half calls to a call center in order to complete that application for, for funding. So, so I think, you know, kind of what it does is, is help people to um, understand what are the, you know, get rid of some of the noise and focus on what the key things are um, uh, for their organization. And it also sets a benchmark that they can use. But I don't think the, um, you know, we know that there are outliers right, right now. I mean, if you look at, you look at the figures, you, you'll see some very obvious outliers there. Um, but I think they are so, so far in the outlying space that everybody kind of recognized already that they, they were there. But I think as we move forward and get more mature in this space, it will provide us with some interesting, interesting uh, cross-government measures. Any final questions for David? There's one down the front here. Councillor David Campion, Royal Borough and Chelsea. You haven't mentioned, I know there's a lot of things you could mention, but data security is one of the most important things there is. And I'm afraid the track record of breaking into systems and data getting uh, lost is so significant that I think a lot of people just do not want their information held in IT at the moment. What, 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 are, your, what are your processes you're putting in hand to actually deal with the situation? My understanding is there is no, there's no such thing as a perfect IT system that can't be broken into it, and I think evidence suggests this. Um, agreed, um, but uh, you know it, it's almost. So um, I was having this conversation with my wife last night. Um, she was um, asked to send a copy of her passport uh, to somebody, uh, and we were having the debate around was it more or less secure for her to photocopy it um, and post it, or photocopy it and scan it or to send it as an attachment in an email. Um, and you know, we kind of came to the conclusion that actually it doesn't really matter which, which thing you choose, you're running a risk when, you, when you're dealing with data. So I think um, you know, one of the key things that we're, uh, you know, we've been working with um, uh, people in CSG uh, ar around security policy is, is kind of understanding the real risks to information. So I think historically, um, because of you know, some very well-documented um, data losses, departments have put in place lots and lots of procedures to, to prevent people from doing things. Um, and what usually happens, you know, what that has driven is actually people go around the systems and therefore are even more insecure than they would be if we, if we actually put sensible things in place. So um, you know, one of the, the, the approaches that we took when we, we developed some guidance around how you need to secure um, desktops, you know, operating PCs. We developed that um, jointly with CSG. Um, and they were really helpful for us in terms of, you know, unpicking a lot of the things which departments do by tradition because they think they're minimizing risk and actually saying, no, you know, using modern systems, these, these are the set of things that you do and this is good enough. Um, uh, you know, similarly, we've, we work with them to, to look at some of the myths around use of open source technologies in this space. Um, so uh, I, I guess What's the way to describe it? I guess we're using CSG as, as to some extent, the, the Sinatra test for us, which means that you know, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere um, with them. So when they support it, if CSG support it, that's probably good enough. So, um, but but you know, you can't get to a, a zero risk system. The problem is with BYOD, which is going to be very insecure. This is going to be one of the biggest problems. 
Well, I, I, I almost think, you know, we, we deliberately didn't talk about BYOD in our desktop guidance because I think BYOD tends not to be the issue. It, 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 I think it's an issue which is creating a lot of noise uh, and heat, but actually the, the, the really interesting thing is who's accessing your information and what's the level of trust you have of, of the endpoint that they're accessing it from. And that's really the, you know, the interesting problems. Um, you know, and, and you can address things by you know, lots of different ways, but being sure about those things, I think you know, if you're working on the assumption that actually you don't trust the endpoint, then actually you probably won't trust them enough to share very much information with it. But there will be certain categories of things which are perfectly fine to do. So I think you know, it, it, uh, that, and at that point, I don't really care who owns the device. It's the level of trust I have with the endpoint that I care about. Okay. I think what we'll do now is break for coffee. Can we just say thank you very much again to David?